again for the weekly update, and yeah, feel a little bit down this week. Last week, there was so much promise, so much to look forward to, but here we are, seven short days later, and I am now a 2-8 and eight on the season, with very little chance of making it to the playoffs, and there was something, I thought there was something else that I wasn't, wasn't happy about or disappointed. You know what, I'll probably think of it later. I'm sure it was wasn't something that was all that big, but anyways, here we go, FTFL weekly update, week 10 this week, week 10 this week, I mean, no tell straight, again, the excitement is waiting some, John and I both lost, down to 2-8, and eight. sure, still technically both in it, but after both winning last week, boy, I tell you what, there was a real excitement running wild, uh, on the flip side, is Menomina in trouble, they were unstoppable, Seven and one, and all of a sudden, two weeks later, seven and three, and being swept by a team that was below 500 in Adam Swartz. Now, still, I don't think any trouble of missing the playoffs, but they may know they're no longer a lock to win the division. And this, you know what? That was some depressing news. Now, for some good news, Duke Johnson has finally brought his drive for five into reality. Uh, thank you, Sid. You know what? Maybe, just maybe, Duke Johnson. Wanted to make Cream America great again as well. Um, speaking of teams that maybe are sliding, we said Manamana, Salty. Was on a hot streak, was on a cold streak, was on a hot streak. Now two losses in a row has him at 500, and he is now on the bubble for making the playoffs. Again, still no one technically in, still no one technically out. There are some long shots, but everyone still has a chance with three to go. Let's get to last week's game. Starting off Hulkamaniacs at 2-7, at seven, fresh off a huge victory over Bazinga. Taking out Bazinga yet again at 4-5. and five. This time, did not go the Hulkamaniacs way. 101 for Bazinga, 76 for the Hulkamaniacs. Uh, Big Ben came back to haunt in some ways, 26 points. J.H.I. only had 4.5. Uh, the jury's still out on who won that trade, but this week didn't go in my favor. Uh, Le'Veon Bell, Julio Jones, and A.J. Green combined for 51 points. Not much else from the others, but it definitely all that together was well, more than well enough to beat the Hulkamaniacs, who were led by Aaron Rodgers at 24, and Dustin Hopkins was 17, but they were the only two in double digits. This was not a good week for the Hulkamaniacs. Ten weeks in, still ten weeks without a touchdown from my tight end. Ten weeks! Unheard of. Unheard of. The running back position continues, or sorry, continues, takes another big hit fresh off the press. Christine Michael released. More on that later. Uh, you know, this is uh, definitely uh, the one, I guess, bright spot this week is Dak Prescott is shaping up to be a pretty solid rookie keeper. Next up, Architect at 6-3 and three versus Linkowitz at 2-7. and seven. 129 and a half. Huge week for the Architect. Drops Linkowitz, who only scored 73. 2-8. Two, two Six of the nine of the Architect players were in double digits, led by, holy moly, Ezekiel Elliott in 35 points. I'm still not happy I didn't get to take him in the draft. One spot behind him. Actually, sorry, two. Um, but, man, oh, man, has that kid had a huge huge year. Um, three wide receivers combined for 42 and a half points. That was 35 from Elliott, and I'm telling you what, we are watching now the architect, who a couple weeks I called the pretender, maybe slowly slide into the contender range, may we add? Uh, if you're Linkowitz, again, this, it wasn't your week and it's not been your season. Uh, Matt Ryan only had 14, was definitely off his game this week. Todd Gurley, four and a half. Todd Gurley was a keeper. They were huge. Todd Gurley was maybe going to be the second best running back in all of fantasy football. Barely has over 70 points. It has been a tough, tough year.
for Todd Gurley, uh, 17 from OBJ, but just not enough. The Vikings defense, who at this point, let's be honest, no one is buying anything the Vikings are selling, uh, just two points. The, you know, the, the player that John could count on week on and week out, the Vikings defense has now become a sore spot, only two points. At this point, John may be in a race with me and Eric for who gets the first overall pick in next year's draft. Uh, last game here before the, uh, the break for the one good minute. Menomina. Really? Menomina? At 7-2, and two, taking Adam Swartz. I'm hung 4-5. and five, And for the second straight week, Adam Swartz rises to the occasion, 106.5 to 99. It was close, but it's still a loss if you're Jeff Marks and a win, a huge win for Adam Swartz, who now all of a sudden is in playoff contention, in contention for the second place in the North, in contention for the sixth and final playoff spot, puts himself in a great Great place after two big wins against Marshall. Adam Swartz's team led by Phillip Rivers at 28 and Des Bryant at 19. He survived a combined 17 and a half points from three running backs. Uh, Matt Asiata, of course, still in the starting lineup. Not entirely sure why he isn't starting. Cameron Artis Payne, since he won't stop talking about him on the message board. But I guess that's for another point in time. Um, only a total of five points on the bench. So he made four ones, all of the right decisions this week, and improved to five and five. Marshall falls to seven and three. Who saw that coming? Uh, five and nine in double digits, but not Tom Brady. Only six points from that guy that he gave up a first round pick. Now, the only week that Brady's had is an off week, but let's just hope, if you're Marshall, that this isn't a trend, because boy, oh boy, would that be bad news coming down the stretch. He almost scored 100 points, so it's not like he had a bad week. Um, Procise on the bench with 13 and a half would have made a difference. Marshall claims that's his rookie keeper, and maybe so after, again, Christine Michael gets the boot. More on that right now, let me tell you what, my one good minute this week, let me get my clock all set up and running so I don't cheat you or myself in the actual time frame of this, Christine Michael, you've heard me mention it twice, maybe you saw this in your own, was released today by the Seattle Seahawks. Now, supposedly, see my time. Thomas Rawls is coming back, Precise is playing better, they didn't need Christine Michael. Now, you might remember Christine Michael had a couple of huge games earlier this season. It looked great. And then they just stopped giving him the football, which leads me to my point for the one good minute this week. Fantasy football is nothing but a giant crapshoot full of luck. That's it. Anyone who claims to be good at fantasy football is lying through their teeth. Now, there are some people who have had a real good run of good luck. And there are some people like me who have just had a pretty bad run of Bad luck. I mean, for anyone that says, oh, I'm good at fantasy football, that's a lie. Week in and week out, we are at the whims of players with injuries. We are at the whims of coaches who don't like players. Uh, I mean, from kickers to running backs, I mean, you name it. Every single week, there's a guy that should have played better, should have played more, and didn't. It has nothing to do with talent. There's no one in the world who knows exactly what's going to happen every week and can make the right play every single time. No, it's luck. Now, with that being said, I still enjoy fantasy football. It's one of my favorite things to do, and I love that I'm in this league that's been going on for as long as it has, but bottom line, fantasy football is nothing but luck. All right, let's move on to the last couple games, and these were big games as far as playoff and division-leading implications had to say, had to go with. Uh, Radioactive Monkeys, 5-4, and four, fresh off a loss, taking on Ryan Deesom's Titties and Balls at 6-3, and three. and this one was close, man. Monday night, Goes into Monday night. Deason was down four points. Jeremy Hill on his side versus Giovanni Bernard on, on Salty's side. In the end, when the dust settles, 85 and a half for Deason, 84 for Salty. Takes number, loss two in a row. If you're Ryan, um, you know, he had a, a, you know, Andrew Luck, sorry. He had Andrew Luck, who was on the bench with the bye this week. So he had to play Marcus Merritt, who has been playing well, and as we all know, Sadly, he tore the Packers apart, 28 points from Mariota. He survived a zero from Carlos Hyde. Jordy chipped in 20, uh, one of the bright spots for the Packers, one of the bright spots for Deesom this week as he improved to 7-3. and three. If you're the radioactive monkeys, you got to start to wonder, am I going to continue losing? Am I going to start my next win streak? Um, Cam Newton and, and Garrett Blount both had, both had, both had 22 points on the week. 44 combined, 4 of 9, though, scored less than 5 points. It's almost half your team. So some contributions from some, not contributions from others. Uh, 99 points, though, by the way, 99 points on the bench. Outscored his starters. This game from this week may be a deciding factor when the playoff rosters are set. 
Let's hope, if you're Adam Saltmarsh, this isn't on the negative side of things. Last up, Cray America at 6-3, and three, fresh off support from, I guess, our newly president-elect, um, taking on the pack attack at 3 and 6. Excuse me, bubble in my throat. I'm in the dust set of 114.5 for Cray America, two pack attack 69. The buzzsaw in his rightful place on his rightful team did not disappoint, 24 points. Now, one of his receivers, Al Alshon Jeffrey, only had four points this week, but that's four more points than he'll have for the next four weeks combined. Dude is out. Maybe he'll have to do more flexing the tight end, which he did this week. The first team this year to flex a tight end, and boy, it looked good when the results finally came out. Um, now, if you're the pack attack, you missed having Matthew Stafford out there on a bye. Ryan Matthews with 23 points on the bench, but I'm not, it really wasn't going to matter. This wasn't a big thing for him that it didn't work out. Um, in the end, he's got an extra first and second round pick for next year, so let's be honest, he's already kind of won. That wraps up the games this week. Now, start of the week for this week, Ezekiel Elliott, 35 points, improves the architect to 7-3. and three. Yeah, that's super-duper stud-worthy. Uh, the dud of the week, it would have been Carlos Hyde, but saved by Jeremy Hill. And so the dud of this week goes to none other than Tom Brady. Six points. He was averaging 28 a contest. Marks are lost by less than that. The difference between 28 and 6. Two losses in a row. Gave up a first-round pick. These are the kind of things that start to slide into... You sold the farm. Now, it seems to be a bit of a sell-the-farm battle going on between Markshire and Hagen, so we'll see who in the end wins and who in the end takes it. Um, or in the, that came out wrong. Anyways, the decent update for this week, got to be Adam Saltmarsh. 84 points for your starters, 99 points on the bench. When your bench outscores your starters, that is a terrible, terrible thing. Again, Salty, not your fault, because this is all based on luck, but this week, could be the week that keeps you out of the playoffs. Now, heading into the next week, we got Menomina at 7-3, taking on the Architect at 7-3. Two division leaders this late in the season. Huge clash. Bazinga at 5-5, five five, taking on Cremerica at 7-3. Bazinga hoping to stay on the winning track to keep his playoff spot locked up. Uh, Adam Swartz, I'm hung, up against Ryan Deesom's titties and balls. 5-5 uh, five and five for Adam Swart, 7-3 for Ryan Deese from trying to keep pace with the Architect in his division. And then we've got a couple of stinkers. Lincoln with the 2-8 and eights versus the Radioactive Monkeys who desperately need to win at 5-5. Five and five. And lastly, the Hulkamaniacs at 2-8 and eight taking on the Pack Attack brother-in-law versus brother-in-law. I do believe he's one of the few players I actually have a winning record against in this league. But again, what does that really matter when it was all luck after all? And let's be honest, if anyone could talk about luck... It was me in the year 2003 when I won the FGFL championship. You know what? That puts about a cap on this week's episode of the Weekly Update. I'm going to see if I can get my production crew here to fire up the music, and we're going to head out of here and see you all next week on the Weekly Update. Peace out!